Now, a new analysis shows that the six-tonne iconic altar stone at the heart of Stonehenge originated from northeastern Scotland rather than southwest Wales. Scotland was never simple. Not in its language, not in its legends, and certainly not in its blood. For years, we believed the Scottish genome was mostly Celtic, maybe a dash of Viking for the dramatic flair. But that version of history, it's been completely shattered by recent DNA evidence. Hidden inside bones buried beneath peat bogs and rocky cairns are fragments of a forgotten world. Dark-skinned hunter-gatherers, Bronze Age outsiders, tribal ghosts called Picts, and even distant echoes from Syria, North Africa, and the Arctic Steppe. Some of these genes shouldn't be here. And yet, they're not only here, They've survived untouched in remote Scottish islands, glens and fishing villages, passed down silently for over 10,000 years. This is a story of survival and extinction, of migrations we never recorded, of people who vanished from history, but not from the gene pool. So what makes Scottish DNA so strange? How did it resist the genetic tides that swept through the rest of Europe? And what can it tell us about who the Scots really are and where they truly came from? If the idea that blood remembers what history forgets gives you chills, tap subscribe and stay with Stone and Bone for more ancient mysteries decoded by DNA. And if you're as fascinated by this genetic legacy as we are hit-like, it helps bring these stories to more people who still carry pieces of the past. And tell us below, what part of your ancestry surprised you the most when you looked deeper? Long before clans, kilts, or Celtic myths, Scotland was a frozen wasteland. Roughly 12,000 years ago, during the tail end of the last ice age, thick glaciers covered most of the land. It was lifeless. No trees, no people, just ice, rock, and the roar of melting glaciers carving valleys we now call glens. But as the ice retreated, the land began to breathe again. Forests crept into the south, Rivers swelled, game animals returned, and with them came the first humans, small bands of hunter-gatherers drifting northward from continental Europe, following the herds and fish, seeking new territory. These pioneers weren't Celtic, and they weren't what we imagine when we think Scottish. Genetic reconstructions suggest they had dark skin, blue eyes, and dark, curly hair. A striking appearance by today's standards, but common across Western Europe during the Mesolithic era. They lived in scattered family groups, mostly along rivers and coasts. They fished, hunted red deer and boar, and crafted flint blades and bone tools. Archaeological sites like Cramond and Orense have revealed their camps, but it's DNA that truly brought them to life. What shocked scientists wasn't just that their DNA survived, it was where it survived. Remote highland glens and Hebridean islands still carry traces of these ancient lineages. The genetic markers are rare today, but their persistence tells us something remarkable. In these geographically isolated regions, the earliest settlers' genes weren't wiped out by time. They were preserved like fossils in blood. This phenomenon, called genetic drift, is amplified by Scotland's rugged terrain. Steep hills, treacherous coastlines, and scattered islands created natural gene vaults. Places where small communities bred mostly within themselves for centuries. So while Europe's major cities saw constant waves of invasion, conquest, and intermixing, some parts of Scotland stayed relatively untouched. This is one reason why Scottish DNA especially in the highlands and islands, still holds genetic fingerprints of people who lived over 10,000 years ago. But the story doesn't stop with preservation. As time marched on, new waves of settlers would crash into these ancient bloodlines. Some would blend, some would bury the old, and some would leave only faint echoes. Roughly 4,500 years ago, a seismic shift rippled through prehistoric Scotland. Not through earthquakes or war, but through people carrying pottery. 
Archaeologists call them the Beaker Folk, named after their distinctive bell-shaped ceramic vessels. But it wasn't their pottery that changed Scotland. It was their genes. These newcomers likely originated from Central Europe, regions we now call the Netherlands, Northern France and Germany. They brought with them metal tools, new farming techniques and burial traditions that were entirely foreign to Scotland's native hunter-gatherers. But most importantly, they carried a very different genetic profile. Within just a few centuries, the Beaker people didn't just influence the culture, they overwrote much of the gene pool. Genetic studies show they replaced up to 90% of the male lineage in Britain, including Scotland. That means the bloodlines of many Mesolithic men simply ended while the Beaker DNA surged. But it wasn't a genocide. It was a slow, uneven blending, intermarriage, cultural adoption, gradual shifts. And in isolated places like the Highlands and Hebrides, traces of the older genes still managed to survive. Scotland became a land of dual inheritance, part Ice Age survivor, part continental newcomer. With the Beakers came the Bronze Age, and with it, the first signs of organized tribal life. Farming expanded, permanent dwellings appeared, and long-distance trade routes formed, connecting Scotland with far-off parts of Europe. Society became more structured, but also more vulnerable to outside influence. Soon, language began to shift too. Early Celtic dialects made their way into the region, possibly to through further migration or cultural diffusion. These weren't the Celts of modern mythology yet, but the linguistic seeds had been planted. The landscape was changing, and so was the identity of its people. And from this evolutionary cauldron, something new began to emerge in the north. They carved strange symbols into stone, they terrified Roman soldiers. They fought without leaving written records. They were called the Picts, and they would become one of the most misunderstood groups in European history. For centuries, they were known only by their enemies. The Romans called them the Picti, the Painted Ones. Fierce, untamed, and impossible to conquer. These northern warriors didn't build empires or write history books, but they left behind enigmatic carvings, warrior graves, and a reputation that still echoes through time. They fought from the shadows, northern tribes who defied Roman occupation, living beyond the Forth and Clyde. But for all their impact, the Picts seemed to vanish without a trace by the 9th century. Historians were left to wonder, who were they really, and where did they go? Now, DNA is filling in the blanks. Recent studies from ancient burial sites in places like Ballantor in the Highlands and London Lynx in Fife show that the Picts weren't mysterious invaders. Their genetic signatures match Iron Age populations that had already lived in Scotland for centuries. In other words, they were locals, descendants of the very people who mixed Mesolithic and Beaker blood. The Picts didn't vanish. They simply merged. As Gaelic culture rose in the West, the Picts slowly adopted its language, customs, and names. They were absorbed, but not erased. What's remarkable is that modern Highland Scots still carry traces of this lineage. Their DNA isn't just Scottish, it's Pictish. And in remote areas, isolated for centuries by mountains and sea, these bloodlines stayed surprisingly intact. So, next time you hear someone from Caithness or Ross speak proudly of their roots, remember, they may carry genes once worn like war paint. But Scotland's DNA story doesn't end with tribes and hill warriors. Because while the Picts held firm in the north, new forces were arriving from the south. Ones who wore sandals, built roads, and brought with them distant bloodlines from lands the Scots had never seen. By the time the Picts were raising carved stones in the north, a new empire was rising in the south. The Romans, ambitious and relentless, had reached the fringes of Scotland by the first century CE. They called it Caledonia, 
a land of wild terrain and wilder tribes, and they never truly conquered it. Instead, the Romans built forts, watchtowers, and roads. Hadrian's Wall marked the limit of Roman Britain, with outposts like Vindolander and Trimontium keeping uneasy peace at the edge of the empire. But while Rome couldn't dominate Scotland militarily, it still left a genetic footprint. The Roman legions weren't just Italian. Soldiers came from across the empire, Spain, Syria, North Africa, and were stationed in Britain's borderlands for years. Some of them formed relationships with local women. And while their presence was brief, traces of their Mediterranean and Middle Eastern ancestry still linger in parts of southern Scotland. These aren't dominant genes, and some scientists still debate the data, but certain family lines in the lowlands show hints of foreign mitochondrial and Y-DNA markers that could only have come from these far-flung Roman recruits. This means that even without permanent conquest, the Roman Empire injected threads of global ancestry into the Scottish genome, an echo of an empire that stretched from the sands of Africa to the misty moors of Britain. And once Rome retreated, new seafarers wasted no time filling the power vacuum. They didn't march in columns or build walls. They arrived in longships with blades and fire, and their genes would leave a much louder echo. In the late 8th century, the silence of Scotland's northern coasts was shattered by the arrival of Viking longships. These weren't just raiders, they were settlers. And over the next two centuries, Norsemen would leave a permanent genetic stamp on the Scottish archipelago. The Orkney and Shetland Islands, in particular, became Viking strongholds. Unlike other invaders, the Norse didn't just conquer. They colonized, taking local wives, farming the land, and establishing Norse law and culture. Modern genetic testing reveals that up to 60% of male Y-DNA lines in Orkney today are of Norse origin, a higher percentage than even parts of Norway itself. This shows just how dominant Viking ancestry became in these areas. Even beyond the islands, Viking influence reached into the Hebrides and mainland Scotland, especially coastal regions where trade and conflict were common. But the genetic reach wasn't just physical, it laid the groundwork for Scotland's clan power structure. Later, the Normans, descendants of Vikings who had settled in France, entered Scotland not with axes, but through marriage and royal favour. They mixed Norse, Breton and Frankish bloodlines into the southern aristocracy, reshaping land ownership, clan names and political power. Names like Bruce, Stuart and Sinclair so central to Scottish identity, carry genetic footprints from far beyond the Highlands. These lineages, still traceable today in lowland populations, contrast starkly with the more isolated and ancient bloodlines of the North. So, while the Romans touched the edge of Scotland, the Vikings dug deep roots, especially in the North, where Norse blood still quietly shapes faces, names, and even place names. But as Scotland's external influences grew, something surprising happened internally. The clans, once thought to be families, turned out to be something far more complex. For centuries, the Scottish clan system was seen as a map of family lineage, a living genealogy. Names like MacDonald, MacLeod and Campbell echoed through history, tied to ancient ancestors, battlefields and sacred lands. But modern DNA analysis has revealed something that rewrites this proud tradition. Genetic testing has shown that many clans weren't biological families at all, but social networks. In some major clans like the McDonald's, dozens of unrelated male lines share the same surname, meaning people adopted the clan name for protection, allegiance or land access rather than shared ancestry. By contrast, Clans like the Campbells show a much tighter genetic pattern, with most men sharing a common Y chromosome, suggesting a true paternal founder. These clans acted more like dynasties, expanding from one powerful ancestor over generations. In many cases, being part of a clan was about belonging, not biology. 
After battles or political shifts, families would take on the name of the ruling clan to survive or gain status. Over time, these surnames became banners, not bloodlines. But even within this complexity, Scotland's geography kept shaping its gene pool. The highlands and islands, with their remoteness, acted like genetic time capsules. Communities on islands like Islay and Lewis have retained DNA markers that appear nowhere else, not even in mainland Scotland. This level of regional uniqueness is rare in Europe. Centuries of migration and war usually mix populations thoroughly. But in Scotland, the mountains, locks and seas isolated people just enough to preserve genetic fragments from the Mesolithic, the Bronze Age and the Norse era, all in one body. And as geneticists turn their attention to Scotland's royal bloodlines, the mystery deepens. Traces from figures like Robert the Bruce or Mary Queen of Scots suggest medical traits, like possible leprosy links or genetic disorders, that are only now being investigated. So, while the clan you claim might not match your DNA, the genes you carry still tell a story. A story of migrations, adaptations, and survival on the edge of Europe. Today, you'll find Scottish genes in places where the bagpipes never played and the heather never bloomed. From the plains of Canada to the coasts of New Zealand, from the Appalachians to the Australian outback, millions of people now carry fragments of Scottish DNA, often without knowing it. This massive genetic export began in waves. The highland clearances, colonial migrations, famine and war sent Scots abroad in the thousands. Many carried ancestral DNA from ancient clans, Viking settlers or Mesolithic foragers, embedding those bloodlines into the foundation of entirely new nations. What surprises many is just how specific those links can be. Modern DNA testing can trace someone's ancestry not just to Scotland, but to individual islands or regions. Skye, Orkney, Argyle, Lewis. These places were so genetically distinct that their markers still stand out across oceans and centuries. And while the world changed, some parts of Scotland didn't. The highlands and isles remain time capsules, preserving genetic combinations that are virtually extinct elsewhere in Europe. Traits once carried by Ice Age hunters or Bronze Age settlers still live on in the blood of island fishermen, highland crofters and emigrants who took their stories with them. Even rare genetic markers from North Africa, the Middle East or Siberia still appear occasionally in Scottish DNA. Whether carried by Roman legionaries, Viking explorers or medieval traders, they remind us that no land is ever truly isolated not in spirit, and certainly not in genes. Scotland's DNA is not a clean thread. It's a tapestry, stitched with stone, bone, and fire. It's been shaped by landscape, preserved by hardship, and carried across continents by those who never stopped calling it home. If this journey through time, stone, and bloodlines gave you a new perspective on Scotland's deep and tangled past, make sure to hit that subscribe button. At Stone and Bone, we uncover the hidden stories your DNA still remembers. Ancient migrations, lost tribes, and genetic footprints carved into history. And we'd love to hear from you. Has your DNA test ever revealed a connection you didn't expect? A forgotten region, a mysterious lineage, or maybe a Scottish clan you never knew you belonged to?